decide to do this project on John? Because I wanted people to know about, about John, and, and I wanted them to, to understand more than just John the person, kind of John, what the, the history of his ideas. You know, there have been threads of his ideas that go back much further than most of us can remember. And, and they're, they're, it's a continuum, you know, it's kind of, it, it, starting when John, John came to IBM in 1956, and when it starts from right from that point, and I'm sure that's the point at which I got to know him, is actually in 57, then that the, these ideas that he started then really are, have continued in some very amazing way through to the, to the present time, and, and they'll continue on into the future. Uh, and he's been working over these same ideas, refining them, improving them, adjusting them to the technology that's come along, changing the directions on them, but they, they really have all been very central. These are the ideas that I'm talking about related to, com to uh, computer architecture and to compilers and to the systems around computer architectures. Now, of course, John works in many other areas. He works with speech, and he works with, with technologies, and he works with uh, areas that I don't know anything about at all. <laughs> and and uh, he's in, but I wanted people to, to know about this, and to know about how a great, what a great scientist he is, and how he has impacted where computer science is today and how the depth of the way he has worked in order to achieve that. I mean, it's been, it's been an amazing, it's, it's really quite amazing way, approach to doing science. And, uh, and it's something that, that I think we need to capture, and I think people, we need to see it as a, as a whole, not in terms of the different individual pieces, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of something else, because we tend to see John in, in sometimes in, in those terms. And I wanted to lay out, to the extent that we could with this project, a, a whole picture of, of his ideas and his work and the person. What do you think is an essence of that whole thing? I think it's a vision. I mean, he certainly has had a, a vision and, uh, and a great dedication to, to carrying out that vision. I mean, it's been a vision of, of what is 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 needed, uh, what is good, uh, what can be done, and and in the vision, in fact, the, he's car carrying forward a vision that he really had uh, in in the late fifties, probably before that. But but a vision that's kind of a, a continual vision. I mean, it's been evolving, and and I think that that's uh, been. He is a visionary. There's no question about that. John is is. Above everything else, a visionary, but more than a visionary, he 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 can do the detailed thinking and science to carry that out. I mean, there are plenty of people who are visionaries, but ignore the details. John has always worked on the details, and and the vision. But it's a piece of this big major vision. When did you first see him as? That's a nice way of phrasing it. As a friend. Uh, John already was well known as a very creative person in the in the late fifties. I mean, he was he was already recognized that his ideas were 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 uh, very valid and very exciting, very interesting. And I think it took a little while to for me to at least to s start to see the the vision and the constancy of that vision as it as it um, unfolded. I mean, what, because he works with the details, and one was seeing the details. He wasn't saying, well, this is the grandiose thing I'm wanting to accomplish. He was sort of saying, how are we going to solve this small problem? And this is, and, and start to and work and work on, this, on these particular details. And, and he would grab a problem and just gnaw at it, you know, just work at it. And it would go on, and in fact, he would be working on these same problems years later. You know, it turns over and over and over. Small improvements happening as they as they go on. Let me give you an example. When um, the first time I technically interacted with John was about 1959. I was the manager of the stretch, a uh, part of the stretch compiler, the part of the stretch harvest compiler that had to do with um, optim optimization and with code generation and register allocation, the kind of core of the compiler. 
And, and John, of course, was associated with the Stretch Harvest Project as an architect. And I remember him coming into my office one day, I think it was about 1959, concerned about how we were going to allocate all the registers on Stretch. And, and kind of starting to turn this idea over about how are we going to do this? What was a good way of allocating index registers? And, and we worked on that problem again in the 1960s, in the mid-60s on ACS. Again, he worked through that problem as well as the optimization problem. And then he worked the whole thing through again with the 801 group with, and worked with, working with Greg Chayton who did this wonderful work on graph coloring register allocation. And he's still working on this problem. So it's, it's not as if any of these problems go, tend to go away. I mean, John doesn't let a problem be solved until it's really perfect. And it almost never is quite perfect. <laughs> right. So I, don't see him as a, I didn't see him as a visionary right off because we were so, always so caught up in the, in, in, in the scientific details, in the implement engineering details. I might say, by the way, that I think of John as, as both a scientist and an engineer, uh, and an engineer in the, in the sense of caring about how things work. And in fact, that's probably the most, um, it's, it's kind of the best kind of science, I think, in, for our field. It's sort of caring about how things are built, and, and then putting the science behind it so one can, can reason about it and know that it's correct. But it's, it's also, it's knowing how things are built. Yeah. John, John once told me a wonderful story of him, from, his, from his, when he was young. Um, his mother brought back, had a, brought back a beautiful new bicycle for herself <laughs> and told John that he must not touch that bicycle. And of course, he immediately went out <laughs> and took it totally apart to see how it worked. <laughs> and then he couldn't get it back together. <laughs> and it was at his friend's house, <laughs> so he couldn't come for supper. So he couldn't come. He he didn't come home for supper. And eventually, he had to admit to his mother that he'd taken her brand new nice bicycle all apart. <laughs> but but John what likes to know how things work, and then that's it was very characteristic of him to really get in and find out. Well, he's a very kind person, exceedingly kind person, and he's a very and he's a gentleman, uh, that and um, and he's very caring, and he's and he's a very deep person. He's a very deep human being. You know, one see, sometimes sees the science and all of that, but but he's a he's a very caring individual, and feels deeply for people, and he and he tries to help people, and I and I think that. Uh, I think there's well, that's a good part of of what's so so great great about John. But what relates to this 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 person too, this person this person who is exciting, who's caring, who's who's really just a, kind of all you know a total person, yeah. yeah, different than lots of us, but he's but wonderful. Different in what ways? I mean, it's, he's an individual, right? Right. But but a total individual. I mean, he enjoys many many things, things that are that aren't related to computers as well as things that are related to computers. Yeah. Duke basketball games <laughs> and skiing <laughs> and reading. Skiing oh yes, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. Yeah, John is a good was a good skier, not and um, and kind of a very enthusiastic skier. So, uh, and uh, spent many seasons up at uh, Squ Squaw Valley in addition to his house, he had a house up at uh, Sugarbush, and, uh, and uh, spent a lot of time skiing. Yeah. No, he could stop, I, he would stop and talk about anything. Um, I think the reason some of us say, well, John would talk about computers to, uh, only about computers, is because that's what he knew that he, we were interested in. But, because John related very much to, to what a person was interested in. And, and in other words, it, well, one of the characteristics of John is that he would walk the halls and go around from office to office and person to person 
And of course, the, the research center is a wonderful <laughs> place for somebody like John because there were so many different people there interested in different things. But as John walked around, he would walk into an office and start to talk to that person about what he was, what he knew that person was involved with. He would pick up very often, he had a themes, he was working out with different people. And so he would walk into a person's office and start to talk about uh, what he had been talking to that person about before, the day before, the week before. Sometimes he would just pick up in mid-sentence from something that was three weeks old. And, it, and he had been thinking about that, and he'd been thinking about that in terms of the person that he had been talking to about it. It wasn't, and so it, it was, he would pick up these threads of conversations with individuals, which would go on, for, which, which might go on, these co individual conversations might go on for weeks and months, and, 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 it, but they wouldn't always be about computers. It really depended upon what the person, what he was talking to that person about. And he knew, he, of course, instantly, I mean, that's what was on his mind. When he saw you, he would start to talk about what, he, what was on his mind that he had been talking to you about. You know, he was very directed to the individual. Yeah. It wasn't just what was on his mind, but what it, it was involved you. The, you know. So it was, uh, it, you know, that's why I think we sometimes say John was only, was, was only interested in computers, because, but that's what he talked to us about. But when he, when he, he would talk to other people about other things. Yeah. And so, so I think we, we, he's a very complex man and a very, very exceptional, such an exceptionally broad person, as well as deep in every area, is, in many of these areas. I don't know what area he's not deep in, but <laughs> he's, but so we, we, in any one of us, only see a part of that. Yeah. What did he come into your office and talk about? Oh, we talked about compilers, <laughs> so. <laughs> and then, and, and so we, I mean, that was a, a theme for, for years and years. We would come, he would pick up conversations, we talk about compilers. There's new idea on something. How do we do this? And and it was it was it would, would be fun. I, he'd walk into the office and we and the conversation would start in mid sentence from where we'd left off. And I I would just feel this flow of excitement when he came. And and he would just uh, and then we would start talking. And and he was often working through the same problem. And and if. It was interesting if there was a problem with it, and I said, John, I don't know, don't, this isn't going to work. Then, and here's the reason, and show the detail. He would look at it and leave, <laughs> and and then he would go think about it some more. And I, and I knew that, that that's what it was happening. That he was going had gone off to think about something, and then he would come back in when he had some new insight on it. Or had had some some way of resolving it, or or that I was wrong. So, and it, but it was a wonderful, exciting interaction. I certainly remember the first time he came into my office on the on the stretch project to talk about index registers, signing index registers. Uh, I was feeling pretty overwhelmed at that time. We were tr had a very, very ambitious project, um, a kind of project that I wouldn't start today. <laughs> we, we were pretty naive, and we thought we could do things we couldn't do. And so actually just how to, it, I knew that allocating these, the registers on the stretch machine was very important. Um, but um, I, was, I re remember, I think I wasn't very receptive to kind of getting into some of the details on this. But John, at that point, was not very involved with compilers. It was, it was something he alert, developed later. And intri you know, the, he was concentrating on the machine itself, and um, and it was only afterwards, after that project, that we started to work on um, uh, th th that he started to look at compilers uh, very directly. Let me describe that. The after the, s the completion of the stretch project. Uh, and this very ambitious uh, hardware and an ex exceedingly ambitious compiler. Uh, in fact, the compiler itself was designed to take three source languages and target to two machines, and and with a common middle part. The two machines were Stretch and Harvest, the Harvest attachment to Stretch, which was a very large computer by itself, and um, and and which was very different than Stretch. 
it was really like microcode and stream. It was a streaming machine, of data processing machine, and where which was really microcoded, and the the two the source languages were Fortran, something called Autocoder two, and something called uh, Alpha, which was being done for the, for the stretch um, the Harvest customer, uh, the National Security Agency, and that was a very di those are very different languages, and the compiler had different parsers for translators for uh, those three la source languages, then went through a common middle part, and then had targeted to the two different architectures. And this common middle part was the part that I was responsible for, and had, had a group working on that. And, and it was, uh, we it actually had to develop a lot of new technology for that, and also incorporate technology that was really quite untested. We used we we were the first compiler, I think, to use hashing. Uh, it had just been invented, and I remember one of my people coming in and saying, "We should try this." <laughs> and and it, it, he had read a paper on it, and we should try this. And I was very skeptical, but we did. And so we also had List, a big List um, underlying system in that. And of course, Lists were relatively new at that time. Uh, so it was an extremely ambitious project, and the the target hardware was had deep pipelines in it, uh, which we really didn't do try to take advantage of, and many registers, many more registers than had existed be before, uh, which needed to be allocated. Uh, very very ambitious. So uh, it, what we did after the stretch project, and and I might say the stretch project was uh, we, we pushed on many, many pieces of the technology, in, certainly in, 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 the, in the compiler technology as well as in the, in the architecture. And what we did after the stretch project was jo John came, returned to research. We were working in a product development at that time. John returned to research, and, and I came back to research. And we started on uh, what was to become the ACS project. Uh, it was called System Y at the time. In research, it was actually under Jack Bertram, a small group of people here here in research. And one of the first things we did was to start a, a experimental compiler. Okay, Dick Goldberg uh, managed was my manager. He was in charge of that compiler, and there were a couple of us on the compiler. And uh, the idea was to understand the compiler issues bef in before designing the hardware. And John was in the middle of all of that. And so, just as he did later on with the 801 project, which was the, the risk, uh, the precursor to the risk work, he, the, the compiler work started first, very early. And we, the ideas that came out of that, this experimental compiler, was ex it started in research and then went to the West Coast, to the Advanced Computing Systems Project out there, ACS, um, were, were actually formed the foundations for the uh, optimizing classical optimizing compil uh, uh, compilers today. Um, though I, I should certainly say that w we owed a great debt uh, to the Fortran 1 project. And uh, I want uh, it's uh, a little bit of information about John there. Um, when we started this project, John and I looked at what w had the code produced by the Fortran compilers, and we were absolutely astounded by how good it was. And John, in fact, at one particular program, uh, John and I decided it, it had produced the wrong code. And so John went off to talk to Bacchus and say, look, your compiler is producing the wrong code. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> it was an optimization that no compiler today that I know of does. It, it, so we, had, we, we certainly had a very good foundation on which to start our work. Uh, in, in, in compilers. Let me start again. Yeah, when, when we started to work on the experimental compiler for the precursor to, to ACS, uh, John and I looked at a lot of the, the output, the code that was produced by the Fortran compiler. And it, this is kind of a, a typical of what John does. I mean, details. We went down and worked on, looked through very, every instruction that was produced by these this compiler for, for certain um, uh, certain codes that we were looking at. And, and we came, came across one and we said, this is not right. This code doesn't work. It must be, it's wrong. And so John got in touch with John Backus, 
uh, and and said this 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 is you've produced your compiler is producing the wrong code, and we then we looked at it again more carefully, and it was an optimization that they had done. The code is right. It was an optimization that they had done, which I don't think any compiler today is able to do. It was it, so. That was a, a f the early Fortran One project was a phenomenal project, and really that was where we started on the, on our work on the ACS project. That in our experience with the uh, with the compilers and the and the hardware on Stretch, and so on the ACS project we really started the compiler work very very early, and we did this experimental compiler, in in which we we tr w knowing that in order to be able to drive the kind of machine that John was interested in, uh, and the machine in, embodied many of the uh, ideas from Stretch, much simpler machine, but it still had deep pipelines, lots of registers, and big emphasis upon doing very, very, very high speed n numeric uh, computation. And, and we did, and it needed, in order to be able to make that uh, uh, system useful. We needed to have a very strong optimizing compiler, and we, so and John really led the work right from the beginning to make sure that that compiler was there. So his interest in, in compilers, I think, kind of s s uh, really started as a result of the stretch experience and and recognizing the importance of compilers in in the uh, delivering the performance of a machine like uh, the ACS machine, and. Um, I guess I'd like to say a little, should say a little bit about uh, how that all evolved. We, uh, as a result of the work that we did on ACS on compilers, we laid in the foundations of the the um, theory of optimizing compilers. But the theory came not from s simply sort of trying to develop the theory. It was trying to understand what was needed in, compi in compilers and what was needed to get deliver the performance on the machine in a very, very detailed way, and then trying to abstract out of that into some principles whereby we could, could be, be certain about uh, the, the theory behind the optimization. But it was the, the theory was driven by the practical requirement. One story about where it all ended, I might say, as the, at the the ACS project as um, was ACS machine was had was very complex, and uh, the, the compiler was used to decide how many registers one could uh, could be take we, would be reasonable to have in the machine, and and it was used also to decide how deep the pipelines uh, should be, and 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 how to do the branching structure on the machine. And 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 um, one 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 small story here. There we had we had uh, had a contract uh, with uh, Harando Cookie Cookie. I think I'm sorry, I'm mispronouncing it. Cookie at the University of Chicago, and he and his students were working on some of the numerical uh, library routines. And one particular routine they were very proud of. They came. Some of the students came, and and said. This can be done in 43 cycles on the um, ACS. So we coded it up in, this was hand coded, we coded it in for, up in Fortran and ran it through our experimental compiler and it did it in 38. <laughs> so it was, it was a testimony to the compiler itself. But it, it was also because the machine was very complex. And, but the compiler, we pushed the technology so far that we were able to do better than hand code on a very complex machine, so. You, I know that the stretch computer and the 801 uh -huh. is in the museum, but they say that there isn't any ACS machine. Um, I started thinking that maybe the ACS never got built except on paper. There were pieces of it built. Uh, I think there is a, an early package somewhere. I think somebody on the West, there is something on the West Coast, right? right. I think probably one of the uh, the things that was most real was the experimental compiler, uh, and in, ter in terms of it, of it actually being able to take code, and and in also with the simulators. We we had a t there were simulators of the machine so that we could actually determine what the the speed at which project the speed at which the 
the uh, uh, hardware would run on some of these problems. Was right. it your 10 simulator engine in practice? No, that, that happened afterwards. That was afterwards. Right. No, these were, these were simulators of various kinds of simulators, you know, timing simulators and instruction simulators and, 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 and so forth. Right. So Of the major projects that John has been associated with, uh, Stretch, ACS, and then this, the RISC family, 801 through RS, the RS6000 that IBM's recently announced, um, I, th I think that some people will view some of those as, as failures. They're not failures at all, because out of each of those projects came a, a tremendous technology fallouts. If we hadn't tried, to do what we, what we were trying to do on stretch, then we, w we wouldn't have pushed the technologies in, in, in many ways. For example, we would not have pushed the technology. John, John invented pipelining. It, got, it was called look ahead there uh, on, on stretch. And, and there were caches on stretch, on at least one. And, and so even though the stretch machine, uh, there were only a very few of them built, eight say, I think there were eight built, um, and it, it, out of those, uh, out of that project came these base ideas, and, and then in ACS was the same thing. I mean, there's great fallout from ACS. This whole compiler technology is certainly one of them, uh, and, and that came out of the ACS project, and, uh, and was, was central to what then happened on the 801 project. Again, here, here carrying forward what I had said earlier about going from, from we'll the okay, I, yeah, there's, there's too many, there's okay. Okay, okay, that's true, okay. Um, let, let me start that whole story over again. That's, I got too many, too many sidetracks there. Um, I, I think, th I believe that all of John's projects, Stretch, ACS, 801, then, uh, w and then his lead in to the RS6000, have been successes in the, t in, in the technology fallout. And f not only fallout into immediately following projects, but into the, the projects that came along. Let's, let's start where, where we are today with the RS6000. It has caches in it. There were caches. John invented caches for for stretch, and did a lot more work on caching for ACS. Let's let's look at the the deep pipelining in in uh, on RS the RS six thousand. Uh, John invented look ahead on for stretch in the late fifties. The the ACS project had deep pipeline, deeper, much deeper pipelines and, and, and much more elaborate instruction look-aheads than in the RS6000. But the reason we have those things in the RS6000 today, and the reason other projects outside IBM have these, these things, is very largely due to the, to the work that had gone on uh, over the years and to, to John's carrying that work forward. I think the, these projects have been successful in that. And I think John is, is not only to be credited with the individual inventions and with the vision of where he wanted all of this to go, but I think he's to be credited with being able to, with carrying the ideas forward they, and, and reusing the good ones and recognizing where there were problems as he went on to the next projects. And, and in particular, one sees the, com uh, the, the emergence of the role of compilers and the, the emergence of the role of software as from the stretch uh, d days when he had really very little interest in that to a big focus on it at the beginning of ACS and r repeatedly another big focus on that in the 801 where this really, and in RS6000. So what we're seeing in the RS6000 is the, is the, is the fruit of those, of those many years. Oh yes, the, John certainly was was a great influence on me. Right. I think that John, uh, you know, I was inspired by his creativity, 
and, and I was inspired by his enthusiasm. And I was inspired by his, his, his enjoyment of, of understanding the details. And, and I think that it's, it's ver certainly very much shaped the way I think about things. You know, I think of myself as being practical and enthusiastic, and, and that's very much shaped by John. And, uh, and, uh, and, and he certainly has had that impact. Right. And uh, that's, that's the scientific side. But uh, John, you know, John has certainly had a personal impact uh, you know, on me in the sense that he's a person that, that I think very, very highly of. Yeah, I really love John, lots like everyone else <laughs> who's gotten to know him very well. Yeah. Is it many strengths? I think John's the John's greatest strength is his spirit, and you know his great creative, caring spirit. He's you know he's a very loving person, and he's a very patient person, and uh, I think uh, he's. He and his and his real spirit in, in wanting to uh, and his integrity, you know, and and his uh, always wanting to do what is right. And the thing that upsets John often is is that this isn't you know that's not right, or it's it's not only a thing that's not right, is that somebody's behaving not behaving as they should behave in some honorable way or something. John, that's the thing that distresses John John most. So he's, he's a true Southern gentleman, <laughs> and with all of the good qualities that that, that in, in implies. Mm -hmm. Part of any of this? Oh yes, yes, yes. Um, working with John was 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 very exciting. <laughs> not not only because of the ideas, the flow of ideas, but the spontaneity in which in which they came out, and the times in which they would sometimes come out. So. He would, he, John worked sometimes 24 hours a day, or he, and he needed often uh, to have a, somebody to talk to about his ideas. And so, and so one could be called at any, you know, any hour of the day or night. When, when we were working on ACS, I had a, an, a, a, an apartment which was within a block of, uh, of John's, and Ricky's Hyatt house was actually in between. So it was very common for John and I, to, John to walk from his apartment to Ricky's, and I would walk from my apartment to Ricky's, and and we would meet there and and uh, discuss uh, you know, compilers, just compilers until late in the night. Yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, it, maybe let me say a little bit more about John as far as his his working style is concerned. John really doesn't write uh, much, or any, I should say, and and he and he and he doesn't like to give talks. He's a little un he's uncomfortable. John is a shy person, and uh, and very diffident, and, and 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 he giving talks is a difficult thing for him, and and so what he the way he works is to work with people. And that's, that's one of the ways he's had so much influence, is that he's been, he, he has that style. He doesn't just go in his office and write a paper, you know, throw it out. He, he goes, he works with people, draws them out, he gets their ideas involved, and he carries the ideas around, and he integrates them, and he carries them, and he adds his own to them. So, so that he's, and, but he needs people in order to be able to carry, to, to work. And, uh, and and I think he works so much of the time, and he kind of in a um, his style of work is is a uh, kind of a stream of consciousness. So you know it doesn't matter what time of day it is or what's going on. You know he just it kind of flows. Did he ever wake you up? Oh yes, <laughs> and it, yeah, it was it was very very common to be called in the middle of the night when he had something something new to say or or sometimes when he was upset about something somebody wasn't doing what they should be doing or things were not going the way he wanted them to go and john had frustrations a, a lot along those lines and some of them were caused by the fact that he always wanted things to be a little bit better than they were he had another new idea that had to go in and of course if you're making a product you you at some point have to say no this is it, you know, this is the end. You know, 
there are no new ideas. We're going to write the manual. We're going to send it to development to, to build it. We're going to do something. And you can't, no more ideas here, John. And, and, so, and that would be a frustration because he would then have one more thing that needed to go in, one more idea that had to be put in. And, and he would get very upset when, we, when one wouldn't do that. I remember a, a, a time when Ed Sussengut, who was the architect, an, an architect, and was writing the manual and kind of settling things on the ACS architecture. And I had an office across from Ed Sussengut, and seeing Ed Sussengut in his very kind way, pulling John by John's tie out of Ed's office and saying, no, John, we settled that yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Glorious. <laughs> um, did you ever manage? I, th I think that John, um, John's first reaction to the to the video was not very was not it was um, indifferent. Um, that's putting it mildly. I think I think he was. He was a little. He was embarrassed about it. He, I don't think he wanted it to happen. I think he saw it as becoming too personal, perhaps. Um, uh, and but he's gotten caught up in it lately, and um, and part of the reason he's gotten caught up in this is because he 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 knows that we're going over some of the ideas that he had in in stretch and on ACS and and are bringing those ideas out. He's been working with some of the speakers in order to make sure that the right ideas are, 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 are come out, and and, he re, and to and he's recalling the stories from those days and and telling people about it. In fact, he he said to to someone to Mike Blasgan, um, "You're going to be surprised about what you learn from this." <laughs> and and so he's very he is very enthusiastic. Yeah. Right. I think it's a little hard. Um, it's a little hard to capture John in in words, and uh, and what kind of person he is. And we, we talk a lot about his science, and we talk about different parts, the influence he's had on on uh, the scientific work, influence he's had on people, and and we've and but we. It's a little hard to capture the kind of enthusiasm and the spirit of this man, the kind of excitement that would happen when he's around, and and which which is just is 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 everyone picks up on it. People pick up on this, and you start to feel drawn into it and drawn into this excitement and wanting to be to be part of it and. And it's also the, the side of John, there's a side of John too, which, which there's a certain sadness about. And you're wanting to take, you know, you're a little bit of a wanting to care, to, to care for him. And, um, and I think, he, I think he's, uh, he's somebody that, that a lot of people have wanted to, you know, not only to, to, to take care of him as well as wanting to be, be with him a lot. I mean, that's, people love him. And, uh, and and I don't use that term lightly. You know, people, whenever people, one often sees when people speak about John, uh, they will their kind of face lights up, and they say, and and it's kind of a warmth for this man. Yeah, he's very special. Yeah. Uh huh. I think there's a lot of good material in there. The hard thing is going to be taking just uh -huh. pieces out. Yes. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. easier, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you can't think of anything else, no, I think we're all set. Yeah. Thank you.
so I did use it. I like everyone else first, but it's young, it's so much technology. Okay, I'm using that. Yeah. I guess Sorry. Right. Yeah. Let's go from the press. Yeah. This is just for her, so it's a little bit.